Amen. It is so good to see you here this morning. If you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 12. We are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And for the rest of 2022, we'll be teaching and preaching life change from the gospel of Luke. Now, if you did not bring a Bible with you today, that's okay. We got you covered. We have a Bible located under the seat in front of you. Feel free to grab one of those Bibles and you'll find Luke chapter 12 on page 1035. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, let me invite invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you. If it has a stamp marked Calvary Baptist Church, scratch it out, write your name in it, call it your own. The only thing that we would ask you to do is not use it as a coaster at your house. Instead, open it up and read it and what you read begin to apply to your life. If you're searching for hope, if you're looking for change in your life, if you begin to apply God's word, you're going to discover God will change your life. Uh, today, our passage of scripture really addresses one of the ugliest, obnoxious character traits that can be displayed in a person's life. Today, the passage of scripture addresses greed. Now, not greed like Apollo greed or the apostles greed. We're, we're talking greed as in greediness. Greed as in the Grinch. Grease as in Ebenezer Scrooge or Walter White from Breaking Bad. Whatever your genre is, we're addressing greed. And, and really in our culture today, we see greed on display in almost every drama that's on television. I mean, if there's a central character, most likely that person is a greedy person. They, they want what's not theirs, they take, or at least they're the person that you begin to love to hate because of their sharpness or their rudeness. Today, I want to invite you to examine your own heart. I want you to take a look at yourself to determine if this characteristic, if greed is a characteristic of your life. I don't want you to examine the heart of the person you came with today. I don't want you to examine the heart of the person behind you or in front of you, but I want you to take the mirror of God's word and look at it and examine whether or not greed is a characteristic in your life. Now, in Luke chapter 12, as Jesus was teaching about hypocrisy and he's teaching about persecution, somebody from the crowd interrupted him. Somebody from the crowd interrupted Jesus' flow, Jesus' train of thought. And if you've ever done any type of public speaking, you'll know that when somebody interrupts your train of thought, it can kind of throw you for a loop. Uh, one time I was early on in ministry. It was, a, gosh, about 1990, 98, 99. It was sometime early on. And I was invited to speak at a guest, as a guest at a little church in Nashville, Tennessee. There were about 45 people there. And as I was beginning that flow and as I was beginning that message, a short, stocky man, and it has nothing to do with his size, it's just who he was, a short, stocky man walked down the center of the aisle, sat down in the pew, and within moments began obnoxiously snoring. Like it was the loud snoring. If you are married to a snorer, it was the type of snorer that you take your elbow and jab him in the throat. It was so obnoxious. Well, as I, so I, you know, I kind of shake it off and then I kind of get back in the rhythm and he starts snoring again. And, and then he wakes himself up and he mumbles something and he falls back to sleep. Well, come to find out the man had narcolepsy, which was this condition where he could fall asleep at any moment, which is fine. I just wish he hadn't fallen asleep during one of my first messages. But Jesus is teaching in this passage of scripture and he's flowing and he's teaching and then somebody interrupts them. It's like this, they had an agenda. And they say, yeah, but Jesus, what about this? And so that's the passage of scripture we're going to look at. It's a passage of scripture that addresses greed. So let's take a look, Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 
But Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what will I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, there are two teaching uh, passages. There's two teaching moments that Jesus addressed greed. The first passage or the first area was in the instance of the two brothers. And then Jesus moves on to the parable of this rich man. First, I want us to take a look at this, the, what happened with these two brothers. Uh, the man that interrupted Jesus had a very specific agenda. Jesus wasn't talking about what he wanted to talk about. Jesus was talking about persecution and Jesus was talking about hypocrisy. But this young guy out in the crowd said, yeah, but what about my brother who isn't dividing the inheritance with me? What about him, Jesus? And Jesus addressed it very plainly. Now to understand the context a little bit better, understand that when a father died, within a family, within a household, it was the responsibility of the oldest son to determine how to divide the inheritance. And so in this moment, in this situation, the older son had a responsibility to either say to the rest of the family, I'm going to give you some of dad's inheritance and I'm going to divide it up or I'm not going to. If the son wanted to, he would be able to keep all of the inheritance to himself. And if he wanted to, he could divide it up to his brothers. Now, for some reason, the oldest son had not yet divided up the inheritance and the younger son called him out in front of Jesus. Now, the older brother may have just simply been dragging his feet. He may have been, may have been lazy or maybe the oldest son, as was his right then, decided I'm not gonna give the rest of my family diddly squat. I'm not going to give them a penny. I'm going to keep it all to myself. We don't know in this story if the younger brother was the one showing the greed and saying, I want what's not mine, or if it's the older brother saying, I'm not gonna give you guys anything. When my dad passed away, my brothers and sisters had no problem dividing up his estate. And that's because my dad didn't have one. He did not have an estate to pass on. When he died in that hospital in Tampa, Florida, he was penniless. There wasn't any gas in his truck. His truck didn't run. Even his pack of cigarettes was empty. My dad had absolutely nothing that we could fight or we could argue over. But after 25 years of ministry, I do understand that sometimes inheritance and what is left when a parent passes on, boy, it can really cause some division inside a family. Uh, people fight over things that are sentimental. They fight over bank accounts. They, they fight over housing. And I understand that for some of you guys, you've walked through difficult journeys with your family and, and maybe your family views you like this younger son uh, viewed his brother or this younger brother viewed his older brother or, or maybe you view somebody from your family like the older brother. Either way, I want you to know and I want you to, to, to understand that sometimes what is left is difficult and it's hard to manage what is left. And maybe you understand how the two brothers felt. 
The oldest had no obligation to share the inheritance and the youngest had no right to claim it. We don't really know who was being greedy in this passage, but we do know this. Greedy people take from others. If there's a person that wrestles with greed, if there's a person who's greedy, greedy people take from others. Now, one of these brothers was being greedy. Maybe both of them were being greedy. Maybe both of them were being selfish. And Jesus responded to the younger one. And Jesus maybe responded to the older brother that could have been in the crowd. And he said, guard yourself from every type of covetousness. Guard yourself, Jesus said, from every type of greed. Now, we don't use that word covet too much today, but essentially what it means to covet is to have a strong desire for something that is not yours. Jesus is warning us against having this inner compulsion that desires what other people have so much that we are willing to reach out and take it even if it's not rightfully ours. Now, it may be the type of greed or covering uh, or coveting. It may be the type that really desires another person's spouse. It may be the type of coveting when Jesus said, guard yourself against all types. Maybe you covet something that belongs to another person. It might be the vehicle. It might be the bank account. It might be the family. It may be the children. It may be uh, the title or the job or the occupation. Maybe it's their personality. Maybe you just in your heart say, I wish I, had, uh, I was more like that. And maybe you take by destroying them with gossip and lies. Maybe it's their home. But coveting that Jesus warns about, it's this inner compulsion that desires something that isn't ours. And greed makes you want it so bad that you attempt to take it. It, it, Greed looks like two kids fighting over a ball on the playground. It's mine. No, it's not. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. Or what I like to think about when I think about greed are the monkey videos that I watch on YouTube and Facebook. Guys, I can get lost watching videos of monkeys fighting with each other on Facebook or YouTube or Reels or TikTok or whatever it is. I think monkeys are the funniest creature on the planet and I love to watch videos of them. So I'm gonna use them as an illustration of greed. It just is what it is. I might be lying in bed trying to fall asleep at night and I'm scrolling through and I see a video of a monkey and I sit up and I start laughing. My wife will be reading her Bible and she'll be praying to the Lord. I'm like, yeah, but look at this monkey. You know, he's flinging poop on people and he's being selfish and he's taking things that don't belong to him and they're fighting over this and mama monkey snatching the baby monkey away from another monkey that was trying to snatch it up. I have probably watched several hundred videos of monkeys. They are selfish. They're mean to each other. They fight over food. They scream to get what they want. And all the videos that I've ever watched of a monkey, I've never seen a generous monkey. I've never seen a self-sacrificing monkey. They're always focused on themselves. It almost reminds me of parenting, doesn't it? Like, oh, break it up, break it up. But the monkey videos that I see, they're, they're funny, they're selfish, they're greedy. And sometimes they remind me of people. When they argue, when they fuss, when they fight, when they scream, when they just want their way, It reminds me of this obnoxious characteristic that God is pointing out in the lives of people when he says, beware of every type of covetousness. Beware of every type of greed. When people who have been created in the image of God become selfish and live out greed in their lives, it must be pretty obnoxious to our generous, loving, heavenly father. 
So Jesus addresses the two boys. Then he goes further because his train of thought has been interrupted. He goes further to teach about greed by sharing the story of a man who was a, a, a landowner and the land produced a lot, of, a lot of crop and he was stuffing it all in his barns and he's sitting back saying, I've got too much stuff. Like my, my storehouses, my barns, they're not big enough. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my small barns and I'm going to build larger ones and I'll be able to stuff everything inside these barns. And then when I'm done building and stuffing and hoarding, then I'm going to say to myself, my soul, or the translation is, my friend, you've done enough. You've got it made for the rest of your life. Look at your wealth, look at your possessions. You've got it all. Now just relax, eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of your life. The story that Jesus tells shows us that greedy people are blind to the needs of others. Greedy people are blind to the needs of others. Now, I understand that this is a parable, but it's interesting, and we have to point out that the rich man did not try to discover the needs of the people in his community. Jesus wasn't criticizing this rich man in the story because he had wealth. Jesus was criticizing him because he was focused exclusively on himself. He didn't say, hey, I've got plenty for myself, but there are others who go to bed hungry. So I'm going to keep my barn full, but the excess that comes in, I'm gonna use it to bless other people in my community. He only focused on his own needs. He wanted to make sure that he had plenty for today, plenty for tomorrow, plenty for his future, and he lived exclusively for himself. His future mattered more than the future of other people. His comfort mattered more than the comfort of other people. Hoarding property mattered more than people. His possessions mattered more than people. That's because greedy people are blind to the needs of others. Greedy people don't think about the needs of others. And since you're not greedy, since you're not a selfish person, I want you to ask yourself this question, how does God want you to partner with him to meet the needs of those around you? How does God want you to partner with him to meet the needs of the people living on your street or maybe the people that you're sitting with today? How does God want to use you to take care of others? It may be that you're aware of a family in need. They're not able to pay their bills. And it may be that you're able to pay your bills and you're able to do it abundantly so. That your barn is full and you've got all these extra resources coming in. God might be wanting you to help bless somebody else by taking care of their needs. Write down that person's address, write down their name and try to meet their needs today. Or maybe you have a, a neighbor whose car is always breaking down. You always see him at the stop sign. You always see him at the stoplight. You're honking your horn at him and you're driving around them. But maybe God's desire is for you to bless them. Get ready with a vehicle. You know, one of those five cars that don't fit into your garage because all your other stuff is out there. Maybe God is saying to you, hey, I want you to give generously because he's blessed you with all these resources and you've got all this extra stuff. Maybe God wants you to bless others with the extra stuff. Or maybe somebody you know just needs some encouragement. Maybe they're alone, maybe they're tired, maybe they're discouraged by life and they just simply need to know that you care for them, that God loves them and that you're praying for them. Write down their name and from that abundance of your rich relationship with God, bless them with encouragement. Bless them with kindness. Bless them with words of affirmation. Bless them with a prayer and then let them know that you're praying for them. 
And if people continue to come to your mind, thank God, right? Thank God that you're not blind. Thank God that you're not like this wealthy man who couldn't take his eyes off of himself. Thank God that your eyes are open to the needs of others. And then just simply say, God, how do you want to use me to meet their needs? And, and by the way, if you are interested in demonstrating generosity to others, and you're thinking about how you can demonstrate financially, our Parker campus was gifted with an entire church facility, the land, the building, but as we've looked at renovating that Parker campus, we've learned that it's gonna cost about $600,000 to renovate the worship center and to renovate the children's ministry space. And it may actually cost more than that. So if you would like to give, you can write that check out with uh, $600,000 on the dollar sign. Just drop it in the offering box on your way out. We're not twisting your arm, but if you're living in excess, we'd love for you to bless the Calvary Parker campus with that check. But if you are a follower of Jesus, and seriously, you have been blessed with the most generous, benevolent act that's ever happened to mankind. Jesus gave up his life for you. The Son of God poured out his blood for you. If you're that follower of Jesus, you've already received the lavish, uh, anointed, most gracious act that's ever been bestowed upon humanity. And that is Jesus emptying his life out for you. God has generously given you forgiveness for your sins and he's restored your relationship with God. There's nothing more that God could ever possibly give than his son. And that's because God was not blind to our need for him. God recognized we needed Jesus. God recognized that we would never be made right with him, that there would always be a penalty for our sin, and he paid the price for our sin. So you and I could be whole. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. Translation, the people around you that are in need they may not be followers of Jesus. In fact, they may hate God and be antagonistic toward the Christian faith. They may not deserve you to show love and kindness and blessing to them. So do it anyway. Show them kindness anyway. Show them compassion anyway. Show them generosity anyway. Show them what a born again, radical follower of Jesus Christ really lives like. And bless them out of the same abundance or from the same abundance that you have been blessed. So in this story, Jesus shares the harshest truth about what God thinks about greedy people. In the story, the man was patting himself on the back. He was calling himself friend. Uh, that's that translation for soul. And it's probably because he didn't have any other friends. He's looking around at all his stuff. God wants us to understand that greedy people are fools, not friends. Greedy people are fools, not friends. God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who is going to get everything that you've worked for? If you're not choosing to bless others out of the abundance that you've received from God, when you pass, who's going to get it? You might say, oh, well, I've left that to my children. I've got that written off. I've, I, I've, I've already assigned who's going to get what. Wouldn't you rather die living joyfully and generously than hanging on to it until the very end when you pass away? Wouldn't you rather die knowing that you've lived a generous, benevolent life just as God gave up his life for you and I? 
Now, we might be tempted to think that, hey, this, this man, he, he's just being wise. He's, he's doing what the Proverbs teaches us about ants, and they, they store away, and we're supposed to store up stuff for, for difficult seasons in life. He was saving for a rainy day. He was practicing a penny saved, a penny earned. Why is God giving him such a difficult time? It's not because the man was rich that God called him a fool. Because you can be poor and you can still be a fool. The reason why Jesus called this man a fool was because he lived his life without practicing generosity. He lived his life without practicing kindness. He wasn't being a friend to himself. He wasn't being a friend to other people. He but wasn't being a friend toward God. He was living with this narrow tunnel vision that what he wanted mattered more than anything around him. And if you truly love, if you truly care for yourself, you are going to love and care for other people. Uh, and that means you're gonna see their needs. You're gonna talk about their needs, maybe with your life group, maybe with a small group of friends. You're gonna recognize it and you're gonna say, let's do something about the needs of other people. See, when we practice saving, which is a wise thing, whether it's saving money or whether it's hoarding stuff in our garages, when we save without demonstrating generosity, God calls that foolish. That's, that's the nutshell of this passage. I mean, that's what's happening here. The man wasn't criticized because of his wealth. He was criticized because he didn't care about others through his actions by demonstrating generosity. And here's the good news. If you've lived up until this point like a selfish, greedy monkey, like a selfish, greedy person, if you've lived your life hoarding and grabbing and stealing and taking, you can change. You can be transformed. You can experience the extravagant generosity of God's love. You can surrender your life to Jesus. You can receive forgiveness for your selfishness, for your sin, and you can be made a brand new person today because the only remedy for greed is a rich relationship with God. That's what prevents greed. A rich relationship with God prevents greed. So in the story, God called the man a fool. But as Jesus wrapped up the parable, he said to the crowd that was listening, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. If the words that God spoke in this passage to that man, if they've kind of poked your heart a little bit, if they've kind of bothered you, if you really kind of see yourself that you have been living your life as a fool, focused exclusively on yourself, and if you would like to begin living an unselfish life, it begins by practicing what Jesus said in Luke 9, to die to yourself, give up your rights, and take up your cross on a regular basis. It begins by surrendering your life to Jesus and acknowledging that, hey, I can't change, but God can change me. And when you surrender your life to Jesus, when you commit your life to Jesus, you're made new from the inside out. And the desires you have change. God can change the most selfish person among us God can transform their hearts, the most greedy person among us, and make them the most generous, thoughtful, caring, loving person that the planet has ever seen. And if you would like to surrender your life to Jesus, our prayer team is gonna be here at the close of the last song. They would love to lead you to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. They would love to see you surrender your life to Christ. Now, if you've already been a follower of Jesus and you wrestle with selfishness and you wrestle with greed, don't give up on yourself. You're walking in this process of becoming more and more like Jesus every single day. 
So just recognize that. Say, God, this is a characteristic of me and I don't like it. Would you change me? Would you help me become more like you? Open up my eyes to the needs of those around me. Help me not to be blind any longer so that I can partner with you in being a blessing to the world around me. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this passage of scripture that sometimes as we read it, can step on our toes and at other times encourage us to draw into that rich relationship with you. Father, it's our prayer that you would guide us. It's our prayer that you would direct us. It's our prayer that you would continue to make us the men and women you've created us to be. And it's our prayer, Father, that you would be glorified throughout the rest of our worship. And if there's an individual that hasn't yet committed their life to you, if there's an individual that hasn't yet declared to the world they're a follower of Jesus through baptism, Lord, it's our prayer you would help them take that next step, whatever it is, in the process of becoming more like you. Lord, we love you. We continue to yield to you and we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.